everybody? Welcome to The Slice. Today I have an amazing guest. She was top 300 WTA singles and doubles. More importantly, she is an amazing person. Please welcome in Amanda Fink. Amanda, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you so, so much for having me. This is really cool and I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, I tried to do my best uh, intro of you, but you know, you compiled up quite a long list of accolades and it's it's pretty impressive to say the least. Yeah, I'm really lucky. Tennis has been able to give me a lot in my life and to be able to kind of be in the full circle of playing the junior college pro and then coming around to coaching and, and falling in love with coaching like I have and being able to help with coaching education and bringing up junior players as well as helping adults and everyone at the club level has been a really, really great experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud of it. Absolutely. And before we dive into just talking about tennis and the pandemic and things like that, can you tell everybody just a little bit about your, your, you know, your amazing background? Sure. So like you said, I, I kind of came, I came up through the junior and college rankings. I was able, was lucky enough to get to top of the junior rankings as well as compete for USC um, during an especially great time to be an athlete at USC, yeah. both, you know, at the, in the tennis world and quite honestly, in the whole athletic scheme of things there. Um, I graduated from 2000, in 2009 with a degree in psychology and decided that I wanted to play professionally. Um, I thought I had what it took. <laughs> And uh, I, I had a great experience. I didn't, I didn't get to, you know, the, the grand slam level, so to say, but I, I got to play a lot of cool events, meet a lot of cool people um, and, and get ranked high enough so that I can still use, use that information at cocktail par parties and still impress people just a little bit. Um, it, uh, after three years of playing professionally, uh, I just from my entire life of traveling and kind of doing things on your own, as you know, the tennis world kind of is, when you're doing that professionally, it just kind of wore, wore, wore me down. It was time to, I wanted to be in one place. So I ended up coming back home in, in Calabasas where I grew up. And until I figured out what I wanted to do, my parents recommended that I started coaching some kids in our area. And I got connected with the club, my local club that I grew up at, um, at the Calabasas Tennis Swim Center and started coaching and fell in love with working with people and learning how people work and how they learn. And, and building relationships with people. So once I learned that coaching was far beyond, you know, my ability to deliver, you know, information about tennis and my experiences, but it was, is more about kind of the human experience. I think that's really what's drawn me to coaching and, and why I'm so involved in the USPTA um, as well as, you know, speaking and, and the other projects I'm involved with now, but I've, I've kind of gone, you know, really headfirst into trying to leave tennis better than I, I, I you know, I came up with. And I had a great experience, so it's going to be difficult to do, but I really, really continue to strive to make tennis bigger and better. Yeah, um, you, you just hit on a couple of really, really big points, really amazing points that I, I just have to point out. One of those points in my mind is, you know, coaching tennis is so much more than that. And I think it's, it's the ability to understand people, it's the ability to see them grow, it's it's how you see things progressing in their lives. And I think there's there's so many life lessons that I've learned on the tennis court that I apply in my everyday life. And just mm -hmm. being out there coaching and, and really giving kids that level of confidence that, you know, can transition into other things in life. I, I just, I have a special, you know, knack and for that as well as, you know, I want to grow the game. And that kind of brings me to my next question of, in regards to growing the game. You know, we're, we're living through a pandemic and, you know, there are things that have, you know, totally, you know, shaken up the world. Um, but I actually think, you know, when the dust settles, it's maybe good for the, the sport because there are people who probably would have never picked up a tennis racket now coming into the sport. Um, and I was curious to see in your area, how has that effect been from, you know, a tennis participation standpoint? Have you just seen people you think uh, may never play tennis stepping on the tennis court? What's going on with that? Sure. Um, this has been a really interesting time in my life because I actually just moved a month ago from San Diego to Tucson. So I've kind of I've gotten a little bit of, of both perspectives of Southern California and the Southwest. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's been a clear you know, raise in participation on the tennis courts, you know, from the country club level to public courts. You're seeing people that are playing that you would never 
you would never expect to see on the courts because it is, it is the safest activity that, that people have found that they can do. Um, and I think people are realizing the, the, the amazing benefits that you and I know about tennis that they never thought about once they've kind of gotten on the court. So the, the key becomes, you know, yes, we've gotten a, a higher boost, definitely of participation in tennis, but, you know, and, and hopefully not, hopefully things won't be like this forever and other activities are slowly starting to return and, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. So, you know, I think the main question is, is, you know, there's a lot more people that are playing now, but when, when things do return and our full line of choices return, you know, how we're going to keep and engage these people that have started to play and started to kind of find a connection to it. That's why I think, you know, our role as providers, as coaches, as people like you that are creating amazing content, it's really important to, to be able to keep the engagement and keep the level of fun and enjoyment of tennis up and be able to show that, you know, tennis isn't just about, you know, creating the next great number one in the world. It's about creating a great lifestyle, creating healthy habits, creating a great social sport. There's so much more to tennis than I think a lot of people give it credit for. I know for me, not only have I got to experience it competitively, but I met my husband playing tennis. Um, I've met a lot of my friends playing tennis. Um, I tell anyone that starts playing that even if it's not going to be your end goal, you know, as a profession, like it is for me, it's still one of the most amazing things you could do is participate in tennis. And, and I hope to keep trying to strive to figure out, you know, the, the best ways that we can keep our, these players that are playing engaged. Oh man, you just, <laughs> I laugh at <laughs> so many good things. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Where do I, I told you I really like talking about stuff. Where do I, so I, <laughs> where do I just start with that? I mean, the one thing you said that that really sticks with me is one, um, it reminds me of my days at Wilson. And I, I spent three and a half years uh, working for Wilson. And the thing we tried to do while we were there is take Wilson from this, Wilson Tennis from this kind of old school, old Phil brand to this hip, new, young, cool type brand um, from racket designs and things like that. And and I just think that's so important. Tennis should be cool. You should be able to come out and have fun and be yourself. You shouldn't necessarily think you have to, well, I'm going to play tennis. I need to act a certain way. You just, it's a sport where you can be yourself. And I think having coaches that really push that are young, energetic, fun. They understand the game and they understand what you said is like, hey, if your goal is you want to be Roger Federer, sure, let's go train like that. But if your goal is to stay in shape, have fun, meet new people, hey, we can do that. And I can ensure you that you will get there. And I think a lot of it comes from, you know, having those conversations with people and understanding people to say, hey, what are you trying to do on the tennis court? And once you know what they're trying to do as a coach, you can usually get them there. But I think step one is really starting with that. Hey, let's let's have fun. This is a fun sport. You know, I'm going to do my right. best to make it easy for you and put you in the best position to be successful on the court. If as a passionate individual, would you say that, is that what kind of made you like, so as dedicated to the sport and being around the sport as you are, or is there something else that you think attributed to your passion in tennis? That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think my passion comes from, it's been something I've been good at, you know, when you, you know, you, you think you're special at something like whether it's playing on the tour or coaching, I think I just have a really, the analytical mind when it comes to tennis, not necessarily other things, but right. I the X's and O's of tennis. And it makes it really fun to try to figure out, Hey, if you're just picked up a racket for the first time, how can I get you to hit 10 balls in a row? Like what does yeah. that pathway look like? So for me, that, that is fun. And so I get so wrapped up in coaching people that if they make 10, it's like, I want to celebrate with them. So I have that passion to see people get better. But to your point, you mentioned earlier, it's about understanding people. Um, right. Prior to this whole pandemic, I actually, I was working for a startup that was uh, based in the Bay and I was opening the Chicago office and it was company engagement uh, through sports. And the funny thing was the most important piece of that and how we were going to grow was with our coaches. And I think the most important one of, if not the most important thing to, in order to grow tennis is to make sure you have really good coaches. And I like what the USTA is doing. I like what the USPTA is doing because the way their brands are now coming off, they're making coaching look fun and they're providing right. resources where 
hey, I never really thought about that, but maybe that's something there's now a pathway for me understanding how I can progress through coaching. There's more tools and resources uh, more now than ever. So I think you may look over the future, you'll see the shift of, hey, the, you know, the average tennis coach being 50, 55 years old, and I'm making that up, but on the older end to a shift where you'll have a good portion of tennis coaches being 30 to 35 to 37 to 40. Um, I think that's where it could net out when this whole transformation is done. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about, you know, highlighting, bringing, you know, high energy coaching, high, you know, the best in, in coaching that we can to the forefront. We're constantly trying to look for feedback about, you know, what is it, what is it going to take to have, you know, our up and coming coaches more involved in the community, more, more active, because I think a lot of times, we always talk about how tennis coaching, sometimes coaches can be on their own little island <laughs> and, and kind of want to stay in their bubble. And there's, and there's a lot more out there, a lot more opportunities, a lot more benefits um, that, than, than we've ever imagined. And, and we're constantly looking for those people to tell us, you know, hey, you know, what do you need? What, what, what can we help you with? Yeah, and, and to the content point you mentioned earlier, and one of the reasons why I started Toss and Spin was to deliver you know, amazing content, but more content that allowed me to be myself, right? I didn't have to right. try to or fit into what I call, you know, a quote unquote corporate mold. And tennis right. has always given me the ability to, to be myself and express myself in a fun and passionate way. And I think when it comes to coaching, you have to find coaches that, you know, hey, I do teach tennis, but I want to do so much more than that with the sport because I want to provide that joy to others that tennis has given me. And the one thing I find or I've found from the people I teach, you know, tennis to here in Chicago is that once they get into it, tennis is very addicting. It's like, hey, sure. I'm playing, okay, it's cold now. Where can I play indoors? Are there tournaments? Are there leagues? So really building out that, that platform or pathway for not only students, but for coaches you know, here's different awards you can do. Here's what you do after two years of coaching here. Um, and really having that blueprint for coaches, um, I think could really continue to help the game grow. Absolutely, totally agree. And what do you think from your perspective, like what are some of those attributes that really, that really make a good coach? I think, I think that definitely having a high level of energy um, is definitely very helpful. And it, that doesn't have to be like, like what I do, which is, you know, the, uh, the, the bubbles type of a thing, but it, it, meaning that, you know, people that are really willing to, to be vocal, to be, to be engaged with people. I mean, those, those I think are the, the people that, you know, you know, others tend to, to see more identify with connect with is, you know, people that aren't afraid, like you said, I'm not, you know, afraid to be myself. Um, and that has served me really, really well in coaching, um, honestly, the ability to listen, to be able to ask someone, you know, what, what they want to work on, what their goals are, being able to ask a lot of questions to get to know somebody and cater their experience to their own journey, as opposed to a cookie cutter mold of, you know, oh, today we're going to learn forehand and it goes like this. Everyone is a little different in how they learn when they should learn certain tools and their, their own personal journey through tennis and, and a coach that can be patient and understanding of that process, I think those are, are the best people that are out there. The people that are high energy, passionate, and the people that can understand and learn from their students as well. 100%, I, I couldn't agree more because I think it's about having that balance, right? Between right. your technical coach and someone who's gonna have fun and be energetic. And you know, the one, I always laugh because sometimes you run into some coaches who are like super, super technical. And maybe, you know, the, like I said, the person just wants to make, how can I rally 10 balls back and forth? That's, that's right. fully goal. Not like, hey, your forehand, you need to play with a semi-Western grip. You need the ball in front. Like some of those, it's just about reading, you know, reading different people. So I agree. Right. I agree and I've had people that have come to me that are like super, you know, that are really into delving into, you know, the technique of things. And, you know, I, I do that to a certain extent, but there are times too where I will pass that for, I will say, you know what? There's this coach and they're all about that. I will get you to a certain point, but if this is really your passion, this might be your connection. Because everyone has, you know, just like relationships, right? You gel with different people too. And that's just as an important of a thing to understand as, you know, being a good coach or, or not is, is have, being able to understand, you know, you, you might not have the perfect connection with everybody. Everyone has different relationships with people and we'll gel with different people too. And that's okay. 
<laughs> you're, you're, you're speaking my language because I was literally thinking about that a few weeks ago. Like I'm so high energy. I'm bouncing around on the tennis court. I'm walking on my tippy toes. And I was thinking, I was like, you know, of all these people I teach, I'm sure there's someone who's like, hey, I wish Chris would probably just dial it back a little bit. To, to, it's not to, possible. <laughs> no, but finding finding that 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 coach, you know, who um, I guess as a player, you, you're looking for a coach that fits your mold and what you're looking to do. And I think communication of that is is so important to to ensuring that that experience is great. And again, it, it's not rocket science, but if you have a great experience on the tennis court, you most likely will keep coming back and back again. Same thing like, you know, me going to Soul Cycle in the past or Barry's Boot Camp or eating my favorite food. If my experience is great, you know, I continue to find my way back. Absolutely. And you know, the funny thing too is um, when I was talking to Cy at Wilson, mm -hmm. I heard, I started hearing about your on-court presentations and I, <laughs> I went and I, <laughs> you know, analytical looking them up and I was like, whoa, you're, you're like really good on court. Talk about, you know, how important you feel just the, the coaching education, the, the on court education is to, to the growing piece of the game. Sure. So I, I, I'm, I'm convinced at this point, obviously there, there's, there are some things at the top that do trickle down every year about, you know, new techniques, new things happening. We should all be paying attention, you know, how players are, how the game is evolving on the tour. But uh, I think that for the most part, I, I go about coaching education as well. I'm not about reinventing the wheel. I'm not about, I'm not going to go out and talk about, you know, the new modern forehand or, you know, the best way to hit the backhand slice, because I mean, that's just, one, it's not me. And two, I feel like when I go here, when I want, when I, was new to coaching and I wanted to learn. I, I did want to learn how to be a great teacher, but I also needed to learn how to be a great professional. How, how was what I was going to do affect people and quite honestly, give me a career, have something where I'm going to make enough money to survive and continue to be a part of tennis because that's not quite honestly, that's not easy. You know, as playing for a living is not easy. So mm -hmm. when I thought about that, um, you know, I knew that I'm, Honestly, I like attention and I, I'm, I'm a fan of, of being in, in, in the forefront in front of people um, that is up my alley. So I thought about, you know, what I thought I can contribute from my experiences and, and the best thing I could contribute is, is kind of what we were talking about earlier about how do I connect with people? How do I create a meaningful experience to someone so they connect with the game, but also have a great experience with me? and want to continue to do lessons, clinics, everything, you know, and various other projects with, with myself. And, and that has come about being able to be true to myself and, and being able to share with people, hey, you know, this is what you can share with clients. This is the stuff you don't want to share with clients. Yeah. Uh, these are the questions you want to ask. These are the things that you want to be aware of when you are working with a person and their psychology. So I'm kind of more about delivering that information as well as I also love cardio tennis. I love the idea of being able to have lots of people on the court, maybe not a great idea right now, but <laughs> lots of people on the court at one time uh, doing something really fun. So I'm big, also a big fan of presenting on big group games, how to you know keep drills lively, things like that. Things that I, I hope will be relevant that other coaches will want to use because uh, the most, the things that clients usually seek from me most besides obviously learning to play is having a good time, getting a good workout and meeting other people. And so I like to deliver content about, about that, about how you can better serve your clientele doing that, because that I think is what players are looking for and how we keep them in the game. A hundred percent, man, you're, you're like spot on. <laughs> I, love, I love the thoughts. Seriously. No, yeah. I, I yeah, I think if, if people are having fun on the court, they'll keep coming back. And that's the one thing, you know, call it independent pro that I am or teaching pro. The one thing I'm always thinking about is like, hey, how do I get this person to keep coming back? And what I yeah. found this summer is just even even creating like a, a small pathway for them to continue to play the game. And that may be connecting them with other people I coach um, so they can play matches. That's worked really well. Right back and they're saying hey Chris I lost 6-3 but it was great like I think I can beat this guy or girl like what what do I need to do here's what happened let's okay great let's work on that so that's you know this connectivity piece of, of tennis 
has, you know, has really worked well for me. But I think the, the again, people want to come on the court to have fun. They want to get better. And if you can find a way to, to make sure they do those two things, I don't see why they wouldn't come back. Right. And you're totally right, especially with new players that, you know, when new players come to the court, all they want to be able to do is is hit the ball with someone else and be able to play a real match. I mean, that is yeah. usually most people's beginning short term goals when they come on the court. Otherwise, they, they probably wouldn't be there if they were just there just to hit a ball. They want to be able to play with other people and play matches successfully. So it sounds like you're doing a great job of that. And I know you mentioned your your relationship with Wilson, and I'm I'm super excited. I just I just uh, had a you know my my connection with Wilson, and I really look forward to to the new year. They've really gotten behind what what I'm doing as a coach and what I'm doing for for coaching education, um, and I'm really really excited to be able to hopefully be able to work with them to put rackets in you know new players' hands and continue to grow tennis. And uh, and I I couldn't think of a better partner to have for it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make sure I send that that portion specifically to them. They'll love it. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that's what it's about, right? It's, there's many there's many levers you can pull on, but it's like, how do you get rackets in kids' hands? How do you right. make it more accessible? How do you inc- improve coaching, you know, the educational piece of it? The one thing I've, you know, this is past learnings, but, you know, I think tennis, some tennis coaches tend to you know, hey, I'm, they're stuck in their own way. I know what I need to know. And I'm just, I don't want to do more than I have to, right? The, right. the thing that I think, and I'm really curious about hearing your perspective on well, a couple of things, but the one that comes to mind is, you know, being on a tennis court, you know, whatever, six, seven, eight, however long hours you are, or we all are every day or a couple of days a week, you know, it becomes to take a toll on the body. And how do you prolong yourself to do what you, you know, want to do, for, for years and years to come. And I think that's an interesting piece of, of coaching education that I personally haven't seen. That doesn't mean it's not out there, but how do yeah. I get stronger? How do I stay fit? How do I stay flexible? You know, because if my shoulder hurts or, you know, right. I neck or a stiff back, all of a sudden it's like, I'm out, I can't teach. And to me, it's like, you can't work and that's no fun. So um, curious to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, you're, you know what, you're absolutely right. That's a really good thought. I'm going to bring that up to some people when they're thinking about topics that they should cover at conferences. I think that that's true. Um, I mean, for, from my perspective, and I know I've had, I've definitely gone through burnout. I've gone through some things that are definitely been indicative of me <laughs> getting older, unfortunately. And, um, so I, I totally understand <laughs> where, where that comes from. And I think, I think obviously I think that it ends up being worth it in the end because as much as there's those little pockets of burnout, it does kind of end up getting canceled out usually by the endorphins that I get from, <laughs> from people. Um, but, um, but in terms of, of your thought, I think, I think one, I think there's a lot of, when we talk about this a lot in coaching circles, I think there is a lot of focus on trying to um, put more energy into developing successful clinics versus eight hours of lessons when, you know, you can get more people out of court, deliver more information to more people in a certain amount of time. And clinics tend to be more fun for, for people, again, to interact with each other. They tend to be easier for the pro because you're not doing as much physically. And quite honestly, monetarily, you're, you usually are, if you are constructing, if you can construct your clinic format, right, it can be more profitable than teaching private lessons. And I think everyone is learning that. Um, and I think it's going to be really important moving forward, especially for our clients to understand, like I'm currently, um, I'll, I'm not totally booked up yet, but I'm getting very close. And I, and I, I have to do a better job of seeing if I can formulate that just so I can keep myself <laughs> in better condition for everyone but also obviously <laughs> can't do this now all the time but usually I get a, have to get a massage at least once a month I should be getting more of them I just I just I'm so bad at spending money um <laughs> that's, that's, not bad. Say that's bad I think yeah uh, no it's not bad but it's, it's, it's important it's an important it's an important thing yeah, it's an, it's an important thing, though, because if, if, you know, if you can't last, then you can't continue to deliver the game to others. So it is important to, oh, my gosh, my, my PT is going to love me, to foam roll and to do all these things that you just don't want to do, even though you can just do them watching television. I never want to do them, but 
yeah, if I don't do them, I probably won't last nearly as long as I can. So, um, you know, so taking care of your body, obviously, making sure you have a day off. I think there's still a lot of coaches that teach seven days a week because they feel like, you know, they got to to make a living. But I think there are ways around that where where you got to make sure that you do have that day off and you do have time to actually take or make the time to take care of your body. I do work out still a couple times a week. That's gotten harder with COVID, but I've, I've tried. <laughs> um, but it, it is, it is the last thing you want to do sometimes, you know, when you have a seven, eight hour work day is to think about working out, but you just got to think, you know, if I can do, even if it's just little, if it's just maintenance work, I can prolong, you know, my body and my career, but you're absolutely right. I could probably talk about that forever. That is a really good topic. And, um, we should definitely be talking about it with other coaches more. <laughs> yeah. And you, the fun thing for me, I actually really enjoy hitting lessons, which is, gift and the curse right like it just makes me feel like hey I can still hit the ball I'm back to the college days I'm still in shape um but you're you're a hundred percent right and actually one of my uh, former teammates um from the University of Toledo teaches and we were talking about just how do you get you know you know do instead of teaching eight hours how do you teach four hours and get four people on the tennis court you know and do small pods whether they're kids or adults or whatever it may be because you know, it's, it's still fun. Uh, you play a lot of games, people have a lot of fun. Um, however, it's, it's going to be much better for your body. And sometimes you're so used to living in the, the right now that you're not like, oh, in 10 years, I'll still be able to do it. You know, you want to make sure you're taking those necessary steps. And I think there's, there's an opportunity, in my opinion, to, I'd be super curious to, to learn more about, you know, sh specific stretches for coaches or yoga routines for, for coaches that are gonna help you, you know, feel better, teach longer, or not necessarily longer in the terms of hours, but in terms of years, right? You know, mm -hmm. get out there at 50 years old and feel like I can, you know, still pound away at the ball and I'm not wearing five knee braces and, right. and a, you know, a leg sleeve or something. And, and to be honest, that might happen anyway, but at least I mean, <laughs> but. But yeah, that's why I encourage coaches, you know, as much as I know it's hard to take time away from coaching to attend these, you know, conferences in your division, whether it's the PTR, PTA or USTA, anything else. But usually conferences have a lot of them do have someone like I've been to conferences that have had, you know, people in, in PT practices come and deliver that information. Racket Fit's obviously been doing a really good job delivering information to coaches. I mean, it's, it's for your players, too, but they usually make a point in the presentation to make part of it. You know, as a coach, how you preserve yourself, because they know how important it is. I think even we had in San Diego a couple years ago, we even had uh, someone had a great idea to bring in a dermatologist just to talk about preserving your skin um, for those of us who are in, in our courts and our outdoors and, and that's kind of really important too, is to be able to preserve your skin. <laughs> so nope. there is really, yeah, there is great education out there. There definitely needs to be more, but I hope that coaches too will will look into the opportunities that are around them because the information I think is out there. It's just it's just hard to ask or hard sometimes to find. But there's always a person that you can ask how how you know something you want to hear about can can be presented or can be heard. And that's and that's how coaching education is made is by hearing you know what you guys what you guys need to know to to make our profession the best it can be. Yeah, uh, I agree. The one thing, you know, even from, from my college days, sometimes you neglect just putting on sunscreen, something as simple as that, right? Yeah. Uh, and now, obviously, I've, I've been married uh, a little over four years, but I'm always making sure some of those little things, my wife says, hey, do you got sunscreen? You got enough water? <laughs> Stretch. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you don't think about it now, but something happens with your skin. Again, you're out. So it's, it's really about yeah. prevention, body protection. Um, that one's going to allow you to do what you do, but two, you know, I get a huge enjoyment waking up early, having my coffee at 5 a.m., hitting the court, you know, it's, it's 70 degrees in Chicago right now, so I'm just, I'm just loving this. Um, yes. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what you said. Yeah, I've also been married about four years, and my husband's the same way, especially with the water, because he knows I'm terrible with hydration. He's like, well, you're in Tucson now. you got to drink the water. <laughs> Cause it's dry. It's dry. It's dry. It's hot and it's dry. <laughs> yeah, it's hot and it's dry. Um, and you're going. This is kind of. It's on the cool. I mean, it's not cool there, but it's on the cooler end right now, right? In comparison. Oh to my gosh. 
because the summer's it, like unbearable. It, yeah, it just started to cool down. I moved here, so my husband started his residency. We moved here because he's doing his ophthalmology residency here, and he had to move here and in, in, in start in July. And I said, there's no way I'm coming and having my first impression of Tucson being 120 in July. So I waited until September to come over, but, and I thought, oh, I'll miss most of the summer. And then I came, they're like, oh, it's the longest summer that's ever been. It was still pretty hot. It just started to cool down yesterday. <laughs> I knew I had an epiphany or something. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's been, it's been pretty hot. It's been definitely an adjustment, but, but it's neat. I honestly, I've never, I'm so spoiled. I've never moved. I've never lived any, I've traveled everywhere, but I've never lived anywhere besides Southern California. So it's been really interesting already just to get a different perspective on, you know, you know, how tennis is different out here, how the weather is different, um, how the tennis ecosystem is just different. So it's, it's, it'll be interesting to learn. Yeah, absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. One more question for you. Um, obviously, I, the one thing I always think a lot about is, you know, tennis is, is growing. It's been a while since it's grown. You know, tennis after the pandemic, what do you, what do you think it's going to look like? That, that's a good question. And I'm going to tell you that that depends on what we're going to do now as providers. Mm. If, you know, with this, with this, like we discussed earlier, with the level of natural engagement we have now, if we can get the up and coming coaches, the high energy coaches, you know, to the forefront and working and being the front face with all these people that are now engaged with tennis, tennis is probably going to explode like it never has before. And I am so excited to see if it does. If I think our providing network is complacent and we think that, that you know, everyone is just gonna stay just because when all the activities return, I think we're making a big mistake. I think that what happens next is going to be very, very dependent on what we do as providers, as what, as what you know, the USTA continues to offer for new players. There's, there's a lot, I think, writing on what happens as we come out of this pandemic. It's, not, it's definitely not just going to be a clear win for tennis. I think it's been a nice coincidence that people have gotten, you know, the, the opportunity, not the opportunity, well, the, the, since the options have been dwindled a little bit, more of a, of a window to try tennis and to be able to explore it with, you know, because there's, there's not a whole lot else to do, but, and, and again, maybe even falling into, you know, finding the benefits of tennis and really liking it. But like we said earlier, it really does take a connection with someone that's already involved to, to really push that, that passion and to, to connect with people and to continue that relationship with tennis. A lot of times it's not usually, I mean, some people have that love on their own. Um, but I think some, you know, a lot of times that can be a rarity. You know, I, I think that has come down to providers to be able to put ourselves at the face of tennis and be able to really, really parade it as it should be. Wow. I could, yeah, I, I was thinking about it and talking to former teammates, a few coaches, and, you know, the, like you said, the time for tennis is now. Um, mm -hmm. The strategy, the implementation, like it has to be now because I personally have, I, I've never lived through anything like this, but um, yeah. it could be, it could be the, the biggest boom that, like you said, we've ever seen in tennis, or it could be the biggest miss. I mean, that's, that's how I look at it. And I think you're spot on with getting those coaches out there to the forefront, to chat with other coaches, to, to just get people to see a, something different. If there's mm -hmm. a small nugget they can take from you that they can add back to their clinics that will make people come back one more time, that's a win. Um, right. You know, getting more people to have more and more play occasions every year. I think, you know, it's really not about the, the high level juniors who are going to play five to seven times a week. It's about you know, that person who's playing once a month, how do you get them to play once a week? Or that person who's playing once a week, how do you get them to play twice a week? You know, that's doubling right. their occasions or tripling their play occasions. So um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, can you tell me a little bit quickly about kind of, I, I haven't gotten the perspective of kind of what's going on in Chicago and how, and how you know, because obviously there's a little more of the indoor component and things there about how tennis is kind of going over there and what you think what what's the the what's your what's your take I guess on the ticker of, of tennis and and what's going on in Chicago yeah I mean right now people don't want to go back inside to play I mean you know I was teaching a few lessons this morning and 
you know, a couple of guys said their club is, you know, averaging seven to 10 percent capacity. Um, right. so that's one side of the coin. The other side is that, you know, all public courts, whether it's 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, are all full. And that's mm-hmm. something good to see, you know, for me as a coach, I, I, I always watch that and I'm like, okay, there's a lot of people playing the game of tennis right now. Um, and the people I teach, and I always recommend, this is one question I started to ask, what's your cold threshold? You know, I've had many people come to me um, and say, hey, I'll play when it's 30 degrees outside, I'll play when it's 35, because, you know, they're not going inside to work out, they're not going on the tennis court inside, so what are they going to do? And they're like, hey, I'll, I'll get an hour of tennis outside, I'll feel safe, and let's hit some balls. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity right now in, you know, call it tennis epicenters around the country to really push on those levers to grow tennis and really put programming in place that's going to allow people to continue to play the sport. Um, I, I think I, you know, I was talking to someone two days ago and I said, you know, if I can go to a student and say, here's three different ways for you to continue to play the game. Yeah. Well, here's two people you can call and you can play sets against. Here's two classes that I offer that, you know, hey, you can come, you'll enjoy the level. Like just having it all right there is going to make it easy. People, tennis consumers, tennis coaches, they want things to be easy. So if it's very easy for them, they'll continue to play. If it's like, I got to Google it and then I'm not sure about this program. So now I got to ask, Chris, is this good? No, I'll just (laughs) just go back to Soul Cycle. You know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, yeah. I can, I have the app, I'll just click up, I'm in the class. So, um, again, I think there's a huge opportunity, not only in Chicago, but in other parts of the U.S. just to grow the game, get more people playing and, and keep them playing. It's easy to get someone to try tennis. It's harder to get them to continue to play. So what are those things we're going to do to continue to help them play? I love that. I love the idea of being ready as a coach to deliver two options to the player, no matter what, about giving them. T- I love to either give them two phone numbers with someone to contact to play two classes or two opportunities. I've never really thought about it that way before. I think that's a really good idea for providers to be able to be expected when you interact with a player to be ready, you know, when you probably had maybe either if they don't take lessons when on you know your your interaction with them or if they do take lessons maybe after like lesson three to be ready to have to have the pathway set for them because you're absolutely right if people don't have it if it's not easy and it's right in front of it's not right in front of them they're they're going somewhere else so I think that's a really really great idea you you should tell that to other people (laughs) you know I'm just I'm just getting there right and and I think And I think it's also, you know, and this comes from lesson retention. What I've learned is that, you know, looking back over the last couple of years, I'll teach a, a group of people and then the next summer they're doing something else, right? They're like, well, this summer we're going to try ba- basketball or flag football or something like that. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's great. But how can I get people who maybe I don't have a touch point with for three months? How can I get them to come play with me? And it's like, hey, offering these different programming options to them and they'll still want to take lessons because it's easy and it's something new because if you're just, you know, after you do 10, 15 lessons of, you know, the same thing without a plan or even if you have a plan, it's still like, okay, this is fun, but I need something new now. But if you can kind of always keep it fresh and new, people will continue to play. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. (laughs) Yeah, sign me up. (laughs) Um, well, you know, being totally honest, those are all the questions I had in being a hundred percent. This was amazing. Your perspective on tennis is one, it's very refreshing because you have a lot of energy and you have a lot of passion to grow the game. But two, I think it just, you know, there needs to be at least 15 clones of you to, to <laughs> go out into different markets and really, um, speak that language to coaches, because I mean, I without a good coach, you, the game's not going to grow. I mean, that's the, to me, that's one of the most important piece to the game growing. I mean, racket companies will continue to make good rackets. Apparel companies will continue to make good clothing, but good coaches are hard to find. So it's how do you continue to create a robust pipeline of new coaches, but also bring the old school coaches along for the ride too. And I think you're, you're in the, you're in the position 
um, with your energy and your knowledge of the game and not to mention your amazing background to do so. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to talk to someone who kind of has that similar, similar thought about, you know, where, where tennis is going and, and the potential of our, of our coaches network. And yeah, like, you know, everybody, I trust me, there are some old school coaches that have more energy than I do and they're rocking it. I just need them in more places. I just, yeah, it's hard. You, you know, we I think we have these amazing people that can only be, you know, in one place at one in one time. And so it's about, you know, having, you know, you or me or these people being able to tap someone else on the shoulder and say, hey, this is what you can do. Like you matter and like what you deliver is important and we can get out there and do something really special. And I think, you know, honestly, programs like this and content like this is definitely keeping people engaged and keeping people know that tennis is out there and it's fun and there are fun people delivering it. So that's, that's really exciting for me too. So it's an absolute pleasure. Yeah, no, I couldn't, again, I couldn't agree more. Um, where can everybody find you? Instagram, Facebook. Oh my gosh, you can, you can find me anywhere now. The part of the pandemic was me getting on Instagram. I had not been on Instagram before March. That was like a whole thing. I started doing a little Instagram live, like you mentioned earlier. Like I interviewed like Luke Jensen that's on there, which was incredible. It was so fun. Um, but yeah, so I'm on Instagram at Amanda Finkmore, and I am at La Paloma uh, Tennis Country Club in Tucson, Arizona. If you want to come find me. Um, but yeah, I'm on Facebook, uh, at Amanda Fink, Instagram. I'm trying to think where else I am. I don't know. The world is like crazy everywhere. Like everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, so that's good. I'll, I'll send you my email and things as well. So you have it, but, but yeah, you, you, you can find me. I, I don't think I'm that difficult to find. I'm pretty out there. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, <laughs> honestly, thank you again. I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was very refreshing. Um, and I look forward to, you know, doing this again with you and, and seeing what, what things look like six months from now, because I think it's going to be even more exciting than it is today. Absolutely. I can't wait. In six months, toss and spin is going to be like everywhere. It's going to be the thing. <laughs> That's what I want. Household name. Household name. Yeah. Listen, it already is. I mean, you gave, well, you're giving away a racket. I mean, you're doing some things. <laughs> doing some things. Yeah, you just got to keep doing, do something, right? It, and my philosophy is just keep moving forward. Whatever you do is just keep learning, keep moving forward. And even I played tennis this long, just never think you know everything. You know what I mean? Right. It's, when people are good at tennis, they have a tendency to think they know everything. But if I can learn a small nugget of information, and like I did from you today, um, I can now take that energy and take that nugget back onto the tennis court and someone's experience will improve just from that. So. Likewise, I'm still in that two, two option coaching concept for sure. So yeah, this is great, great opportunities to learn from each other. So this is, yeah, awesome. Awesome all around and forward we shall go. <laughs> Perfect, yes. Well, thanks again. I will definitely catch up with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much.